This is the second part of uh, my series on, in which I've divided up the Saltzman lecture into three parts. The first part was concerned with the development of orthodontic research um, and the look at uh, how we can develop our outcome sets that would provide us with more information. The second part is concerned with a more controversial area, and that is uh, the orthodontic uncertainty and the orthodontic fringe and the effect of orthodontic fringe on the evidence that we have for our care. So in the previous section, I outlined a way forwards which would strengthen the evidence from our clinical trials. And we can imagine most orthodontic research being carried out with trial-based methods using core outcome sets. And this would increase the level of evidence and research evidence that we have and help reduce our uncertainty about some of the treatments that we provide. But all's not too well in my orthodontic nirvana, and it's simply because, as I explained before, orthodontic research evidence can of course be counteracted by at lower levels of evidence, predominantly by those with a vested interest in the promotion of certain treatments and techniques. And in many ways, research evidence has been um, counteracted and argued against um, and I decided I was going to put some of the arguments that I had heard into the pyramid of denial, which is rather sort of a converse to the pyramid of clinical evidence that I previously discussed. So looking at the basis of this pyramid, there's always that attitude that people have, of, well, I'm not going to take on or accept this type of treatment because I know better. The second level, of course, is when a group of people get together and say, actually, we know better and we don't agree with the conclusions. A more deeper uh, criticism, I suppose, of some research, and this has certainly happened to me, where um, a, sort of a, a highly respected orthodontic uh, professor once took me aside after I'd done a presentation at a conference and said, yes, it was a very interesting talk, but actually you should have asked us for advice before you started that big trial because uh, we would have made you do it better and your conclusions would have been in more agreement to what we actually agree with and support. The other conclusion, of course, is a straightforward, you did it wrong, you just simply made mistakes. Another criticism of trials is that the treatment isn't individualised and that we treat people as a number to a very strict protocol. That really couldn't be further from the truth. All patients in a trial are treated to as high a standard as possible. And of course, if a trial is a pragmatic real-world study, for example, our orthodontic mechanics would change to the benefit of the patient. You don't stick rigidly to the protocol. You treat the patient and the study as if it was in the real world. And the other final argument is put forward is my patients are different from yours or those that took part in the trial. This, of course, is complete nonsense because what they're trying to argue is that their patients are genetically, sociologically and demographically different from every other patient in the world and that they're a unique population. And that is never the case. So that leads us then to orthodontic quackery, which really is a sort of tries to counteract um, current orthodontic research-based thinking. And orthodontic quackery can really be um, defined as the promotion of unsubstantiated methods that lack a scientifically plausible rationale. And that's a very careful and carefully phrased statement, is remember these methods lack a plausible rationale, and many of those that have put forward go against a lot of contemporary orthodontic science. So we can look at this in more detail. An orthodontic quackery really recommends against conventional therapies. It's easy for them to say that um, traditional orthodontics causes harm or doesn't do as well as their system, and it really recommends against convention. Interestingly, I can't help thinking that it promotes potentially harmful therapies. They may not cause direct harm to the patients, although you can say overexpansion and overpopulation of incisors could potentially lead to harm. But we also have to remember that every time somebody tries a course of treatment, we burn up that rather valuable cooperation, and that in a way will cause harm to patients. It promotes magical thinking. It's some, of those, some of these treatments are completely illogical. And really, you wonder if the inventors are off with the fairies 
with some of the concepts that they promote, but it's quite surprising how people do sort of grasp hold of them as a method of care. And it also drains patients' bank accounts. I think that's quite important. A lot of the orthodontic fringe treatment uh, isn't provided within health service or insurance schemes. It's direct to patients' costs. And of course, that's quite surprising how much some of these magical treatments cost. I addressed this in a blog post, which was quite popular, where I decided to become an orthodontic quack and a snake oil salesman. And I explored this further with the quackery checklist. So if I wanted to make quite a lot of money out of a quackery type of treatment, my first step is to develop a new disease. And we can think of some of these, such as craniofacial dystrophy, and even some aspects of breathing and sleep disordered breathing. Um, it is a relatively new disorder that's been discovered in the last 15 to 20 years, and it's as if the orthodontists have suddenly discovered and developed this problem. We develop a new method of diagnosis. There are cephalometric analyses that I can't understand and many other people can't that are used to identify the features of a child's face that can be treated by this new method. And of course, the, with the evolution of cone bean CT, it's almost endless, the uh, methods of uh, measurements that people can make. We can have a new name for treatment. We've got orthotropics. We've got orthodontic um, breathing physicians. They can set up courses for dentists, and that's very important. The, the classic orthodontic quack will set up a course for dentists and, say, run a two-day airport course and treat against or teach against conventional orthodontic wisdom. The interesting thing is, is that they're targeting dentists because dentists don't have the, basic, the orthodontic knowledge that specialists have. So they're fairly easy pickings for this source of income. They also criticise others, they criticise established orthodontists and finally they resist debate and dismiss research evidence, particularly stating that their type of treatment isn't amenable to um, orthodontic research because it's special and rather unique. <clears throat> Some examples that we can think of here is that expansion all the time movement which is gathering momentum within orthodontics. Um, particularly with the advent of expanders that can be screwed into the palate. We have orthotropics and myofunctional therapy based upon uh, re-educating or supposedly re-education and retraining muscular function. I think that so many of the claims that were made in terms of self-legation are orthodontic quackery. Um, they are completely lacking in science and it was quite surprising how the profession bought into those. We've recently got the development of orthodontic airway physicians who seem to think that simply expanding an upper arch increases the airway with very little proof that that actually occurs. And then of course we've got the methods to speed up orthodontics, again based on some tenuous scientific link grasped by the companies and their key opinion leaders and in fact we know that most of these actually show that they have no effect. So looking forwards then, that wasn't very well received, um, uh, that post on um, how I should be an orthodontic quack. So I did another one on how I should become an orthodontic key opinion leader. Key opinion leaders are becoming very well known within orthodontics. There's a lot of promotion for the, by these type of people. And essentially they're people that are paid by the companies to sell their products. They, run, they tend to run their own conferences. Um, one thing that I have noticed about them is they seem to try and be very cool. They wear very casual clothes and they take photographs like this of jumping up and down as if they're sort of one of the younger people within, uh, within orthodontics. It's all complete nonsense and it's very much of a show. I don't think I've ever jumped up and down on a lecture theatre stage. So a key opinion leader is really defined as a doctor who influences their peers' practice. They try and influence their treatment behaviour and they give lectures promoting their products and are frequently paid for their time. And that's very important because once you are paid a six-figure salary by uh, an orthodontic company, we really have to wonder how your opinion is influenced when you are extolling that on a lecture theatre. So in effect, a key opinion leader is a paid clinical salesperson. They speak at industry-run events and at some of our major conferences run by societies and that's an interesting and perhaps disappointing trend. I am surprised that some of the conferences are 
um, really offering slots uh, to key opinion leaders because really uh, they are simply advertising the products that they're paid to sell. And recently they're having a substantial social media presence and using that social media presence to boost their profile and also sell their products. So recent key opinion leader claims have been, of course, self-legating brackets can do pretty much everything. The carrier appliance also does everything. That's being promoted very uh, heavily by Henry Schein Orthodontics and Louis Carrier himself. Then there's airwage centered orthodontics. Um, and quite interesting, the expansion, self-legation and the carrier seem to have jumped on that bandwagon because we can expand everything all the time and routine use of CBCT for everyone, again, pushed by people who are paid by the CBCT companies. So key opinion leaders have been asked to declare their conflicts, but they don't necessarily do this. They say, for example, I've not been paid to post this. But of course, you've been influenced by the funds that are being paid to you when you do post things up on social media. Another great comment is we're doing some research. It will be published soon. I'm still waiting um, for the research uh, from many of these key opinion leaders about the treatments that they're promoting. Another concept that they put forward, I believe in evidence. I do research in my own day and practice. Um, I'm not interested in an individual doing their own research and not publishing it. I'm interested in somebody carrying out some proper research, publishing it and discussing it in academic forum. They also state that they want to give something back to the specialty by giving their lectures. And that they're being very positive about new developments. And we are so, or I am so negative because I'm questioning the things that they say. They also put out that it takes thousands of hours to put together a presentation and I'm simply being reimbursed to put a presentation together. I've done many presentations and I'm thinking if you're taking thousands of hours to put together a presentation, you're really not working terribly effectively. It doesn't take thousands of hours to put together a presentation. And they also state that payment doesn't compensate time away from the office and family. Well, I would say some of those six-figure payments certainly do compensate any time that's away from the, from the office and family. So I don't go with these arguments. It's just simply smoke and mirrors to try and make us appreciate perhaps that they're doing a good job and putting something back. I'm not so sure that they are putting something back. I think they're actually undermining uh, orthodontic treatment. <clears throat> if you want to know how much they're getting paid for putting something back, a great development in the United States, and it is only the United States that this is done, is this thing called or, or open payments. You can actually put the name of your favourite key opinion leader into this search field and it will let you know how much they were paid by the individual companies in, the, in several financial years. And believe me, those prices are quite eye-watering. So why we can stand on this sort of holier-than-thou attitude with orthodontics and orthodontic specialties and key opinion leaders in the fringe, we do have to consider another side of the story, which is where does the snake oil start? And in many ways, this can happen all over the place. And this is just an example that I took from social media. This is a child um, who's clearly in the transitional dentition. There's a suggestion that those upper permanent canines are um, potentially impacting. They haven't run out of space, but you know, clinically on that radiograph, they do look as though they're potentially getting lost. Someone posted this up and asked for opinions and what the treatment plans. Several people went straight for a cone beam, um, which isn't unreasonable if you're not 100% certain where those uh, canines are. Several went for extraction and season observation, probably the most sensible treatment and there is a degree of evidence base that supports that concept. Twelve of the respondents went for RME. I don't know how they decided to do RME because in effect all they had was a Panorex radiograph. So I don't, you cannot work out whether someone needs expansion or not from a, a two-dimensional um, Panorex. Again, several went for headgear time four. Again, making space, um, there's nothing wrong with that overall concept. I think 
um, a lot of the research that's been done, which has looked at distalizing teeth to make space for impacted canines, hasn't really stood the test of time and probably the extraction of the primary canines is the best treatment and several went for watch and wait. So you can see a great amount of disparity here in the treatment plans from one cephalomet from one sorry panoral radiograph. <clears throat> This was another case that went up on Stylo Italiano, which is a great website uh, or a great Facebook group if you want to see extreme treatments, uh, and many of which um, I, I cannot imagine many orthodontists or restorative dentists doing. So this person flagged this up to say this was an unextraction case one year after orthodontic treatment, uh, and just really to show what they'd done. And in some ways you can look and say, yes, there's probably a degree of expansion that can be done here, but how much should be done? And how much can we really decide from a couple of photographs? And these were the responses that were made here. Expand and the magic will flow. You're going to the magic of expansion. None exo all the way. Again, I'm not 100% that all orthodontists would do this patient none extraction. Uh, strange comments, all day PSL to develop the arches, again swallowing the advertising from the per, um, passive self-legation group. And none extraction, I like to shoot from the rough. To be honest, I don't really understand what that means. It appears that they're suggesting that none extraction treatment is more difficult uh, than um, extraction treatment. That there's some sort of hero for doing this case, none extraction. We all know that it's far more difficult to carry out a treatment if you extract teeth. So again, comments that are completely rubbish. But what this does when you look at this torrent that you get from social media, promoting certain types of treatment, promoting extraction versus non-extraction, expansion, airways, self-legation, orthotropics, you begin to feel that you're wrong all the time. And that in a way does worry me because it makes me think, is orthodontics getting lost? Is our research base getting lost and diluted by this torrent of information that we're getting all the time? Am I wrong all the time? And that's something that we need to consider. And I'll consider some aspects of that in the third part of this lecture, um, which will be on the way forward and potential problems uh, to this solution. I'm sorry, potential solutions to the problems that we are perceiving.